This spooky episode of Defunct TV is sponsored by Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash defunctland for 10% off your own custom website. If you dare. <laughs> In the early 1980s, Saturday Night Live alumni Dan Aykroyd was developing ideas for feature comedy films. He had just wrote and starred in the hit film The Blues Brothers with co-star John Belushi, and he was specifically looking for another film for the duo to lead. Aykroyd had grown up in a family of ghost fanatics, and he had watched countless comedy films from the 30s and 40s of people finding, hunting, or otherwise encountering the other side. The once strong genre included films such as The Ghost Breakers, Ghost Chasers, and Hold That Ghost. Aykroyd sought to revive this genre with Belushi, but after Belushi's untimely death in 1982, Aykroyd would ask Bill Murray, who had just starred in the popular comedy Stripes, to join as his co-star. Stripes director Ivan Reitman and writer Harold Ramis would also be recruited for the project. The draft that Aykroyd had wrote was a blockbuster sci-fi comedy entitled Ghost Smashers, clearly drawing inspiration from the titles of the early genre films. As the script went through rewrites and new drafts, the title would continue to change, until the team landed on a fitting name, Ghostbusters. Everyone immediately knew that it was perfect, but there was just one problem. The name Ghostbusters was already taken. An obscure children's television show that aired almost a decade earlier was already sitting on that title. And while that program might not have invented the ghost comedy genre, they were certainly the first to call themselves the Ghostbusters. The year was 1957, and an animator named Lou Scheimer was working at the Larry Harmon Pictures production company. During his time working on television cartoons, notably Bozo the Clown and Popeye, Scheimer befriended fellow animator Hal Sutherland. Sutherland was a Walt Disney Animation veteran, having worked on such hits as Sleeping Beauty, Lady and the Tramp, and Peter Pan. Despite Larry Harmon Pictures going out of business in 1961, Scheimer and Sutherland continued to work together on other television shows and commercials, and the two eventually decided to make their own studio. With the help of former radio DJ turned television producer Norm Prescott, Scheimer and Sutherland officially founded Filmation Associates in 1962. The name of the company was a simple mashup of their fields of expertise, film and animation. In 1962, Filmation would start work on their first feature-length film, a Wizard of Oz sequel named Journey Back to Oz. Unfortunately, the ambitious project was outside of the scope of the new studio, which instead pivoted to the lucrative landscape of Saturday morning cartoons. Throughout the 1960s, Filmation would produce Saturday morning programs for many DC Comics properties, such as Aquaman and The New Adventures of Superman. The success on Saturday morning would continue for decades, with Filmation creating such popular fare as Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, Star Trek The Animated Series, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, and She-Ra Princess of Power. By 1975, Filmation had become the king of Saturday morning, producing three times more content than the once-dominant Hanna-Barbera Productions. The studio had even finished Journey Back to Oz, releasing it in 1972. Sutherland had retired in 1974, leaving Prescott and Scheimer to run the now-booming business. That same year, Filmation would release their first live-action children's show, the superhero series Shazam, based on the comic book hero that DC had recently acquired. The next year, the company would add two additional live-action shows. The first was The Secret of Isis, the first female-led superhero series. The second was an original sitcom with a fantastic name. The Ghostbusters was a children's comedy series that aired on CBS Saturday mornings at 11.30 a.m. The show's premise was deceptively simple. Three main characters would hunt down and destroy, or bust, ghosts. When casting for the show, Filmation turned to two veteran television stars, Larry Storch and Forrest Tucker. Both Storch and Tucker had co-starred in the sitcom F Troop from 1965 to 1967, and their screen chemistry was undeniable. When show creator Mark Richards was brainstorming the third member of the Ghostbusters crew, the thought of including a gorilla struck him. The idea came from old Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello shorts. The peak of physical comedy, it seemed, could be easily reached with a man in a gorilla suit. After auditions, Hollywood sci-fi memorabilia collector Bob Burns would eventually earn the role of Tracy the Gorilla. It didn't hurt that he already had his own ape suit on hand. For over a decade, Burns had been playing a gorilla named Koger in everything from the Mickey Mouse Club to McDonald's commercials. Burns was the perfect person to play the Ghostbusters' hairiest member, but he wasn't the first choice. 
Another actor was hired to play the gorilla, but after his agent demanded a huge sum for his performance, the actor was let go. The production was in a panic with no actor with a gorilla suit for a replacement and three days to go before filming. The producers were worried that this would mean the cancellation of the show. Finally, someone brought up Burns, and within three hours, he was suited up and auditioning for the role, getting it on the spot. Tucker would play the straight man leader of the group, Jake Kong, his name an homage to King Kong, with the joke being that he was not the group's gorilla. Kong's bumbling slapstick sidekick Eddie Spencer was played by Storch, along with Tracy the Gorilla, both of their names paying homage to Hollywood film legend Spencer Tracy. The three characters ran their own ghost-busting service. Each episode would begin with a setup of the supernatural characters to come. Then, the Ghostbusters' iconic theme song would play. We're the Ghostbusters. I'm Spencer. He's Tracy. I'm Kong. We're the Ghostbusters. We're clever, courageous, and strong. The theme was sung by Tucker and Storch themselves, giving off a very homemade vibe as they gleefully belted out their catchphrase, Let's go, Ghostbusters. Every episode would see a ghost of some famous historic or literary character appear to wreak havoc in a haunted castle outside of town. The villains included the Canterville Ghost, Frankenstein's Monster, the Big Bad Wolf, a ventriloquist dummy, the Flying Dutchman, a Mummy, a Witch, a Vampire, Jekyll and Hyde, Vikings, Merlin the Magician, and the Abominable Snowman. After the theme, the show would find the Ghostbusters in their office, beginning the scene with some sort of classic slapstick gag. The intro scene would typically have some loose relation to the ghost they were about to bust, such as in Dr. Frankenstein, when Spencer describes his recent trip to Tracy's doctor. Well, what did the doctor say? Well, he said to eat 12 bananas and go sleep in a tree. <laughs> Tracy would usually wear a beanie or a silly hat of sorts, so the young viewers would not be scared of him. Kong would then send Spencer and Tracy to pick up their ghost busting assignment at an antique shop. The ghost they would bust would be revealed to them in the form of a self-destructive voice memo from their anonymous leader, Zero, which would always blow up in Tracy's face, Mission Impossible style. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> The ghost-busting assignment would then lead the crew to the haunted castle outside of town to bust some ghosts. The castle set was usually a spooky, cobblestoned interior or a graveyard just outside. A painting of a castle was shown between scenes to function as a contextual transition. The ghosts never appeared distinctly ghastly or ghoulish, rather as solidly flesh and bone as the show's heroes. After hijinks ensued around the castle or its grounds, the Ghostbusters would destroy the ghosts by zapping them out of existence. The tool of choice was a prop named the Dematerializer, which looked similar to a flashbulb camera with bicycle handlebars. A neon zap would emit from the Dematerializer, causing the ghost to dematerialize. Job completed, the Ghostbusters would then return to their office, completing any running gags before the credits. <laughs> Fifteen episodes were filmed over nine weeks in 1975. This rapid-fire style of production was similar to the fast-paced production of Filmation's animations. No matter the ghost of the week, the true stars of the show were undoubtedly the three leads. Storch and Tucker never seemed to phone in any performance, handling the physical comedy and line delivery as the true comedy pros that they were. They were Norsemen, weren't they? Norsemen? I thought Zero said they were horsemen. Yeah. I've been looking for guys in cowboy hats. <laughs> Before they throw a net over you, let's go to the old castle. <laughs> Despite this, the scene stealer was obviously destined to be the gorilla, and Bob Burns played Tracy with so much silly believability that Filmation actually received letters from viewers asking if he was real and how he had been trained. In the opening credits, Burns was even credited as having trained Tracy rather than playing him. The show aired in the fall of 1975 during the Saturday morning time slot on CBS. The program was made for children, but it appealed to the whole family with its timeless gags and great performances. During production, the cast and crew believed the show might even make its way to primetime. Tucker and Storch's F Troop had also began as a children's show, but its popularity proved to reach a broader audience. They believed the same would be true for the Ghostbusters. Tucker said, quote, Mark my words, they'll have to switch the show to primetime. Things were looking up for the Ghostbusters in the fall of 1975, as the show proved to be a big hit on Saturday morning, becoming the second most watched new Saturday morning show of the season, second to Filmation's ISIS. According to Burns, CBS wanted a second season renewal, but Filmation decided to focus on their number one show instead, canceling the Ghostbusters after just 15 episodes. 
Scheimer later admitted that this was a mistake, as the secret of ISIS's popularity soon declined, and the Ghostbusters proved to have a strong fanbase. CBS ran reruns for another year, but the show would soon disappear into obscurity, certainly forever. Of course, this would not be the case, as the Ghostbusters was given one of the most unique revival opportunities in the history of pop culture. In the mid-1980s, Columbia Pictures was deep into development on Dan Aykroyd's supernatural comedy script, with the crew dead set on naming the film Ghostbusters. Although the film bore no resemblance to the characters or plots of the filmation show outside of a few coincidental similarities, the Ghostbusters, nearly a decade after its cancellation, now held all of the cards. The Ghostbusters cast and crew had cycled through every name imaginable. Ghost Smashers, Ghost Breakers, Ghost Stoppers. But when it came time to shoot, the production decided to use Ghostbusters and figure out the licensing later. Despite Universal, who distributed Filmation's Ghostbusters, denying the production the use of the name. After a street scene with 300 extras, all chanting Ghostbusters, a name which the production was explicitly not allowed to use, a producer told Columbia to give it one more shot. Incredibly, Columbia was able to secure the rights to use the title for $500,000 plus 1% of the film's profits. Due to accounting tactics, however, Ghostbusters never technically made a profit, despite its huge success and box office gross. The popularity of the SNL stacked, 1984 Ghostbusters was immediate and intense. The theme song, sung by Ray Parker Jr., was a chart-topping hit, and Ghostbuster merchandise was aggressively marketed and aggressively consumed. So popular was the Ghostbusting foursome of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ernie Hudson that it would have been foolish of Filmation, which still had the rights to the Ghostbusters name, to not capitalize on it. The success of the Ghostbusters film would lead to a spin-off cartoon, and Filmation stepped up to the plate to create it. However, negotiations fell through, but Columbia continued production on their spin-off. Filmation, ready to take their slice of the Ghostbusters pie, did the same quickly churning out their own Ghostbusters cartoon based on the 1975 sitcom. The first episode of Filmation's Ghostbusters would premiere on September 8, 1986, exactly one week before Columbia Pictures Television debuted their animated show, purposefully titled The Real Ghostbusters. The Ghostbusters war was back on. The Real Ghostbusters continued the adventures of Peter Venkman and his proton pack posse, Filmation show, however, would feature the children of the Ghostbusters' main cast, with the sons of Kong and Spencer leading the group. Tracy the Gorilla would also reappear, as did Kong and Spencer in the show's first episode to teach their sons the trade of ghostbusting, although their personalities were noticeably different. If you don't get them with the dematerializer, you can always fall back on the ghost gummer. The animation was darker than its live-action predecessor and more serious, although it did find time for the occasional burst of slapstick. The Ghostbusters now worked out of the Ghost Command. They were equipped with Ghost Buggy, the talking car, Jumping jumper cables! Next time, call before you drop in! And they now had help from friends such as Belfry the Bat and Futura, the Ghostbuster from the future. The series also had a primary antagonist, the nefarious Primeval, who resided with his ghostly henchmen in the Haunt Quarters. Primeval, maybe not so coincidentally, looks suspiciously like He-Man Skeletor. In true Filmation style, the show was crafted quickly and cheaply, reusing animation whenever possible. Filmation produced an astonishing 65 episodes, releasing them all between September and December of 1986. Filmation even created merchandise, and the show continued in reruns for years. Still, the real Ghostbusters would top Filmations, with their show lasting seven seasons and producing a total of 140 episodes from 1986 to 1991, quickly becoming one of the most popular children's cartoons of the time. Filmation's Ghostbusters could not compete with the real Ghostbusters, and the existence of the show was confusing to the children that had just watched the hit comedy film and had not been alive when the Ghostbusters sitcom was on the air. Filmation's Ghostbusters continued the company's legacy of quickly made, crude cartoons, but to many of the kids watching them on Saturday mornings, this was just part of the charm. Filmation would last three more years after producing the Ghostbusters cartoon, being sold by its parent company in 1989 and closing its studio. Unlike Filmation's show, the Ghostbusters franchise has cemented itself in the pop culture lexicon, with sequels, merchandise, and even another cartoon on its resume. And while the majority of people would call the team of four proton pack wearing comedians when they encounter the supernatural, there are still others that would rather call two sitcom veterans and a gorilla. This spooky episode of Defunct TV is sponsored by Squarespace. 
It is scary how easy it is to build your website with Squarespace. Building a blog is terrifyingly simple, and sharing the content is horrifyingly easy to websites such as Facebook, Twitter, and more. <laughs> and now, Squarespace is offering viewers of Defunctland 10% off their first purchase. Just go to squarespace.com slash defunctland or click the link in the description to sign up and start building your online presence. That's squarespace.com slash defunctland to get started today. And happy Halloween. <laughs>